Good morning. <clears throat> this morning's reading are the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Mark. Could uh, could we pray for just a moment? Uh, I know the kids are about to head out the door, and I'm and I'm not gonna I'm not even gonna pretend that I'm gonna stop them at this point. Um, <clears throat> if you're if you're uh, if you have young ones, five to nine, uh, heading to uh, children's chapel, now's the time for them to be dismissed, and they'll they'll be brought back in at the end. But I just thought, why don't we pray for them too uh, as they go off? They're gonna be hearing. God's word, very similarly as, as, as us, the same, same passage of scripture, um, but kind of presented on a, in a, on a level that really hopefully meets them where they are. But let's pray for them too. Father, we are so grateful for the children uh, that have just, that, are, that are, have, wa- have left the room now. Uh, we know that there are some kids that may still be here in the room. And so we pray um, that as your word is read and taught this morning, uh, as we pray for all of us, We pray that you, by your Spirit, will testify by and with your word in their hearts, even as you do in ours, that we would hear from you, that they would hear from you, that they would see that that the truth of your word, that this faith that we hold so dear is not just for their moms and dads, but it is for them as well. Lord, may it be for all of us here today. Would you speak to us now? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are beginning a, a new series of messages this morning. Um, it's, it's, we're we're going to be looking over the, pretty much between now and, and the Advent season, we're going to be looking at this section of Scripture that is typically called the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it, is, it is called that because um, there was a, a large crowd that was gathering and kind of following Jesus wherever he was going. And so we are told uh, at the very beginning of Matthew chapter 5, right in verse 1, that Jesus saw these crowds, and, and, and as he saw them, he went up on a mountainside, and he sat down, and he began to teach them. So really, this sermon is that sermon on the mountainside that Jesus uh, preached that day. And at the end of of chapter 4 of Matthew's gospel, which is right before this this sermon takes place, um, Matthew tells us that Jesus had had been going throughout Galilee. He had been teaching in the synagogues. He had been proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but when I, I hear that reference to Jesus preaching the kingdom of God. This is, this is a way that, that Jesus' preaching is often described in the New Testament, 
But I have to confess to you that, that when I read that, that Jesus is preaching the kingdom, I don't readily have an understanding of what that really means. Like if it had said that Jesus was preaching the gospel, well then, okay, I, I now have a, a, a framework to understand what preaching the gospel sounds like. But when it's described as preaching the kingdom of God, that's a little, that, that's a little less concrete for me. That's a little less uh, easy for me to get my brain around, and yet that's the way that Jesus' preaching is often described in the New Testament. And so um, here's, here's though what I do know. When Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he is preaching the kingdom of God. I think the Sermon on the Mount might be the greatest sampling of what preaching the kingdom of God sounds like and what it looks like because that's really the setup that we have. The end of, of Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God and now let's hear one of those sermons. And so I think that's, I hope that's what we'll, we'll be gaining together as we, we look together this this fall. We began, we read actually and studied last spring the introduction to this sermon. It's called the Beatitudes. And so we spent a, about two months walking through um, verses 1 through 11 or 12 of, of Matthew chapter 5. So now we're picking up where we left off and we're going to continue and we'll study the whole sermon in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So, as Jesus is preaching this sermon, uh, one of the things that I, I find interesting is that, for the most part, Jesus is he, he's preaching the kingdom of God, but as he preaches the kingdom of God, his, his way of contrast or his way of comparing the kingdom of God is not with the world. In other words, he doesn't preach the kingdom of God saying, here's the kingdom of God, it's wonderful, as opposed to the world, which is terrible, right? He doesn't say the kingdom of God is good, the kingdom of the world is evil. I'm not saying that he never, never preaches that way, but in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, that's not the contrast that we really see Jesus making. The contrast that we tend to see in the, in the Sermon on the Mount between, as opposed to the kingdom of God tends to be the teachings of the religious leaders. It's the religious culture that seems to be at odds or in conflict or in contrast to the kingdom of God. Have you ever noticed that, that when Jesus is interacting with people who, who are less religious or frankly just sinful, Jesus is actually quite compassionate He's very patient with them. He's very kind toward them. He seems very loving toward them. But when he interacts with people like the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law, those are the people that he tends to get pretty sharp with, right? He, he tends to have be, be a little bit more combative with them. He challenges them. He presses in against them a little more. The Sermon on the Mount is very, very consistent with that pattern, where, where what we have is, is and, and, I, and I hope that we'll see this, I think we will see this, that Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God in this sermon. He's not really confronting the, war, the world at all. He doesn't call out the world. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, go after the world and say, those sinners, those wicked people. No, no, no. What he tends to do is be more confrontational with the religious. If you think about it, who is it that tends to, to push back against Jesus? Who are the people that tend to, to be more confrontational with Jesus' teaching? It's the religious leaders. The regular people, you know, the common folk, they're, they're fascinated with Jesus. They're, they they want to follow him. They, they want to they hear what he says next. They want to see what he does next. Not so much with the religious people. 
So as we, as we take a look at this Sermon on the Mount, what we're going to see is that Christianity is different from religion. I think this is one of the big themes that we're going to see in this sermon is that Christianity, the, the kingdom of God, is different from religion. It's superior to religion. So in our passage today, what I, what I hope that we will see is that the kingdom of God is brighter, it's deeper, and it's greater than religion. Christianity, the kingdom of God, is brighter, deeper, and greater than anything that, that religion can produce. So let's start with, with brighter. He says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Notice that in verse 15, there are two kinds of light that are mentioned here. One is a light that is on a stand, and then the other light is one that's under a basket. Under, under some type of shade, something that, that, that hinders the light from spreading. Notice that they're both lights. They're both lit. They're both on, right? They're both burning. Realize here that, that the lights that would have come to people's minds as if you were part of the original audience for these sermons, these, these are not lights the way that we tend to think of lights, right? These are not flashlights. These are not spotlights. These are, these are flames. You know, these are, for the most part, these are lanterns that have oil in them and, and some type of a wick, and then the oil comes up through the wick, and then the, there's a flame at the top of it. There, it, it could have been a candle. If, if, the, if you were wealthy enough, you might have had candles, but the regular Average people would have had these lanterns that they would have had to keep refilling with oil. But, but that's, that's the kind of light that, that mentally would have come to mind as Jesus talks about these things. But notice here that, that there's, there's one kind of light that he talks about that is on a stand that gives light to everyone who's, who's around. Anyone who's in the house or everyone who's walking along the path in close proximity to this light, would be able to see. Whereas the light that's under the basket just illuminates the basket. The first difference that, that we see here between the kingdom of God and religion is the way that they interact with and the way they impact the world. Christianity, the kingdom of God, blesses the world. It, it gives light to the world, whereas religion really just illuminates itself. It really just shines a light on the religious person. Think about salt. Salt was a preservative. We don't really use salt that way very much anymore. We have refrigerators and freezers. So that's kind of made this preservative purpose for salt relatively obsolete in, in most of the first world. But in those days, it was, it was something that you put on things that were prone to decay, that were prone to deterioration, right? If you had meat, meat is dead. Sorry to break that to you, those of you who are planning your cookouts this afternoon. You're cooking dead stuff. I think that's what I'm going to be doing today. But, but what you would do in those days is you would rub salt into the meat because it wouldn't, it wouldn't halt the decay, but it would significantly slow it so that the meat could be preserved longer. In other words, salt goes to the problem, right? It goes toward the decay. It engages the decay. You see, the kingdom of God doesn't doesn't look at the decay of the world and withdraw from it. The kingdom of God sees the problems of the world and it moves toward them. It sees the neediness of the world and it, and it enters in as a preservative and as something that makes, that's, at least seeks to make the world better. 
The same thing is true with light. When people are in the dark and they can't see, you turn a light on. Right? You light a lamp. You light the space so that people can see, so that people can live, so that people don't bang into all the furniture, so that people don't walk and fall into a hole or walk off a cliff. But you can't do that under a basket. In other words, light doesn't accomplish that purpose if it's kept under a basket. See, we can't be that kind of influence in the world by keeping to ourselves. We can't be that kind of influence and and preservative and enhancement to the world if we, we see the decay of the world and then we you know, are so concerned about not getting, letting the world get on us that we just hide from the world, that we just withdraw from the world. We won't have that kind of influence like salt and light that Jesus is talking about. Whereas light and salt actually have a blessing impact in the world. But there's another aspect to all of this as well. Not only does the kingdom of God move toward the world. I think as, as Jesus describes it here, there's also a sense in which the kingdom of God is also attractive to the world. Have you ever had food that tastes bland? You know, pro- probably one of the, I mean, we do this everywhere. I mean, in, in my house, we love rice. We eat a lot of rice. But rice by itself, the way it cooks out of the, you know, the way it comes out of the the rice cooker, it's all right, right? Or we, you know, vegetables, bring the broccoli out of the steamer, it's okay. But you know what I normally do? I put salt on it. Okay, yes, butter too. But, you know, (laughs) that really just makes the salt stick to it better. But we put salt on things. You know, one of of the worst things to eat without salt, popcorn. Right? It's it's like, like, what what are we doing here? Right? But you put salt on it, and what do you say then? Notice, Notice you don't say, wow, this is really good salt. No. You say, this is really good popcorn. Because salt really doesn't draw attention to itself. It just enhances other things. The same way, light is the same way, by the way, right? We don't generally, I know that in, in the modern era, you know, you, you, you watch HGTV and, and your lights have to be beautiful, right? But, but really, light, light that's well done doesn't, you don't, it's not like, wow, look at those lights. You know, or you don't, sh- you know, if I shined a flashlight in your eyes, I would say, how, is this pretty helpful to you? You would say, no. The best kind of lighting is the light that you don't even notice but you see by it, right? So I think, I think the same thing is true with, with the kingdom of God, that, that we, we bring it, right? We, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. By, by seeing the neediness of the world and moving toward it, being preservative, making it better, bringing light. Jesus says that not only does that help the world, not only does it it help bring preservation, not only does it help people not fall into a hole, he says also as a result, it helps people see your Father in heaven. You catch that? That it's you're the, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And, and all of the benefits that salt and light bring. And then his conclusion is, and by that, as people see you being salt and light, they will see your Father in heaven. This is what we're called to be. The kingdom of God is brighter. It's also deeper than religion. In verses 17 to 19, Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. 
I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not a jot, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside, anyone who diminishes any of these aspects of the law, these commands, or teaches others to do the same, will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, at first glance, religious people should love this, right? We, we, we look at this and we say, he's valuing the law. He's valuing the precepts. Preach it, rabbi, because that's what the religious people like. They like the rules. They like the, the, the principles. They like the law. But if you keep listening to what Jesus is going to go on and say, you realize that even as he talks about obedience to the law, he's still doing it in a way that contrasts the kingdom of God to the religious leaders, to the religion. Here's how he does it. From here, he's going to say things like this. He's going to say, you've heard it said, don't murder. But I say anyone who hates their brother has already committed murder. Or he's going to say, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you that anyone who lusts after another person has already committed adultery. What is he doing? What is Jesus accomplishing with this? He's challenging the behavior modification approach of the religious leaders. You see, the, the religious leaders are all about behavior. They're all about acting right. They're all about doing the right thing, but, but that's what's on the outside. So, so even as Jesus talks about the law, he's saying you can't just be concerned about the outside. You can't just be concerned about the behavior. You have to be concerned about the heart. It's deeper. Right? You, you're familiar with this. You, you, most of you or a lot of you may remember a time when Jesus is talking directly to the Pharisees. And he says, you know what the problem with you is that you just, you just clean the outside of the cup. And then you're drinking mud. Right, The outside of the cup looks great, but then you pour whatever you're drinking in the cup and you're drinking the dirt. He says, I'm not saying don't clean the outside of the cup, but if you're going to clean the outside of the cup, clean the inside of the cup. Because the kingdom of God is deeper. What's he doing with murder there, right? He's saying, okay, yes, don't commit murder. But don't congratulate yourself because you haven't killed anybody when you hate them. Right? I mean, look at me. I haven't murdered anybody, but I still hate them. That's not great. Jesus, that's, that's what Jesus is saying. He said, you'll really know when the kingdom of God is coming into your life. You'll really know when you're being salt and light, when you not only don't commit murder, but you love your enemies. Oh, <laughs> that's different. One of the things that Christianity is known for, particularly in our, in our modern context, is that Christianity says that sex is for marriage, right? That, that sex outside of marriage is sinful. What's that about? That's what, that's what the world wants to know, right? <laughs> the world hears us talk like this and they think, you know, hey, this, the 19th century called, they want their morals back, right? I mean, you, that's so dated. Well, here's what it's about. Sex is the culmination of giving yourself completely to another. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, exclusively, 
permanently. You see, it's, it's giving your whole self. But see, sex outside of marriage says, I don't really want to give you my whole self. I just want to give myself to you physically. Not necessarily emotionally, not necessarily exclusively, certainly not permanently, probably not spiritually, or we, we, this, this is a little bit better. You know, you'll hear people in the world say, well, I want to give, we want to give ourselves to each other physically and emotionally. Okay, well, that's better than just physically, but it's still not spiritually, it's still not exclusively, it's still not permanently. You see, God created us for complete intimacy, the whole person. So Jesus is saying, you got to go deeper. It's not just about the rule. Yes, don't commit adultery, but, but it's the heart. It's the whole person. That's, that's what physical intimacy is ultimately about. You have to go deeper. Jesus is saying, I haven't come into the world as an antinomian. What is that? I haven't come into the world as somebody who's against the law. Nomian, nomos. It, it, nomos is, uh, is the Greek word for law. So antinomian means anti-law. He says, I'm not an antinomian. I'm not opposed to the law. I haven't, I haven't come here to abolish the law. but I'm calling you to fulfill the law. But I'm I'm not just calling you to fulfill the law outwardly with your behavior like the Pharisees are, like the religious leaders are, but in your hearts as well. Religion doesn't bring that. The kingdom of God does. How? Because it's greater. It's brighter it's deeper because it's greater. In verse 20, he says, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you were in the audience as Jesus was saying these things, you would almost certainly be thinking, then I haven't got a chance. Right? If my righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, no chance for me. I mean, the Pharisees and the scribes and, 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 and the religious leaders, the teachers of the law, righteousness was their full-time job. Right? I mean, every time you see them, they're, they're talking about the law of God. They're praying. They're fasting. They're doing everything religious all the time. I'm never going to be that. Oh, and, and, and as if this is, is, this is helpful, now you're saying it's not enough to just be doing the right things. I have to do them with the right heart now. Right? I mean, you just said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart. So Jesus didn't lower the standard. He's raised the standard. He's implying you have to have more righteousness than the Pharisees because, oh, by the way, by implication, the Pharisees aren't entering. Right? Because their righteousness is only external. It leads to despair. Here's where Jesus is greater. If you, if, you, if you haven't heard anything I've said so far today, that's okay. Please try to pay attention for the next five minutes because it's really important. Where, where religion says, well, then you better get to work, right? I mean, if my righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees, then I better get busy. I better start focusing. I better start paying attention to what I'm really doing here because I need to be better. I need to do more. I need to measure up. That's what religion says. Where religion says that, Jesus says, 
in chapters in verse 17. Don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. That's important. Modern religion tends to recognize that Jesus has fulfilled the prophets. In other words, most religious people, even today, believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of what the prophets were looking for. The prophets talked about one who would come, one who would be the anointed one, one who would be another prophet, maybe even the greatest prophet, who would be the Messiah. And most religious people believe that that's what Jesus is. Most Christian denominations believe that Jesus is the one who fulfills what the Old Testament prophets were looking for, what they were anticipating. Islam believes that Jesus fulfilled the prophets, that Jesus is this one who has come that the prophets in the Old Testament were were talking about, were pointing to. The challenge with that, though, is that if that's all Jesus has done, then he's really just doubled down on the rules, right? It's just more about the rules. The rules are still here. We're still under the rules. That's that's still the focus. He's just come to teach, to reinforce, and ante up on the law. And that just leaves us with more rules, with more weight to carry, with more burden to bear, with more guilt to deal with. But Jesus says, I haven't just come to fulfill the prophets. I've also come to fulfill the law. What does that mean? What it means is that Jesus, in his own living, in his own behaving, he has kept every commandment. He has kept every statute. He has kept every requirement of the law of God. He is the only one who has ever lived who has fulfilled the righteous requirements of God's law. He is the only one whose righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. And he offers to us his record. Do you understand that? That Jesus has has fulfilled the law. He He has done everything that the law requires. And then he turns to us and he offers to us his record, his resume. How would you like to apply for a job and you submit your resume and it's Jesus' resume with your name on it? Now, you and I would say, that's unethical, right? That, that's, that doesn't really represent who I am. You're right. But that's what Jesus is offering us. He's saying, I am offering you the ability to be clothed in my righteous record when you stand before the judgment seat of God. So that when God the Father looks at you, you know what he sees? He sees righteousness. He sees his Son, whom he loves with whom he is well pleased. And you are accepted. Now, is this just me making this up? I mean, it sounds really great, right? But is this just Dan saying this? No. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. You see, he was without sin. He never sinned. There was no law that he did not fulfill, that he did not keep. So he, God, made him, Jesus, who had no sin, he became sin for us 
all of our sins went on Him, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, God incarnate, gives us His righteousness. Here's the irony. Jesus knows what He's doing here in this sermon. He knows what He's doing when He says, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, you have no shot. You're not getting into the kingdom of heaven. He knows that if we really understand what He's saying here, then then that's going to lead us to despair. It's going to lead us to say, I don't stand a chance. And you know what he says at that point? Now you get it. Now you get it. You see, as long as we hear the law and we say, all right, I'm going to do better today. I got this. I, I, now, now, oh, now I know what, what, what the obedience is going to look like. Okay, now, now I'll really do it right. As long as that's your re- response to the law, I know it sounds holy. I know it sounds like the right response. But it's hopeless. Because you can't do it. And the law is powerless to save you. It's only when we come to the law and we hear what's required and we say, I'm up the creek. I, I cannot get there from here. That's when Jesus says, ha, ha, ha. Now you understand. Now you're ready for what I'm offering you. Now you're ready for what I've brought you. You see, religion responds and says, I better get busy. I got to do better. I got to bust my hump to produce. And Jesus is saying, I have come to fulfill it all for you. Do you want me or do you want religion? Do you want what I am doing and what I am bringing you or do you want to just want to keep keep doing your religious thing that is doomed to fail? Do you want me, he says, to come in to your life and live in you and live through you? Because if you do, then I will come into your life. And guess what? I will not change your behavior. I will change your heart. And when I change your heart, you will begin to love what I love. And the kingdom of God will overflow from your heart into every area of your life. So you will be different. But you won't be, won't be different because I'm just going to magically change your behavior. You're going to be different because I'm going to change your heart. And the kingdom of God will come into your life. And it will overflow and it will leave no part of your life unchanged. You see, that's, that's what Jesus, this, I hope this is insightful to you in terms of thinking about some other things that Jesus says about the kingdom. He says, you know, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It starts off really small, but it grows into one of the biggest trees, right? The kingdom of God is like, is like yeast that is kind of worked into the whole lump of dough, and then what happens? The whole thing rises. That little bit of yeast affects everything but it's not from the outside in it's from the inside out it's brighter it's deeper and it's greater than anything that tries to change you from the outside in let's pray together father we I, I can only pray for myself, I can only speak for myself. I feel like I am just starting to scratch the surface of understanding what this kingdom of God is about. 
how it works, how it comes. Lord Jesus, I, I know that it comes through you. It doesn't come apart from you. And it doesn't come apart from having you come into my life, our lives. Lord, I confess that, that I am religious at heart. I want you to show me what I'm supposed to do so that I can work harder at doing it and then somehow present myself acceptable. But if I really understand what you're saying here, if I really understand what the law requires, I have no chance. None of us do. Lord, would you help us to see this truth? Lord, for, for any of us, for all of us who, who still deep down have this thought that I'm going to do better today and that's what's going to be my hope. I'm going to be better this school year. I'm going to be better this month. I'm going to be better this whatever, this chance. Lord, help us to see that in our own strength, in our own goodness, we can't measure up. But rather than having that leave us hopeless, Lord, help us to see that what you are offering us is that you have fulfilled the law already and you're offering us your record. You're offering to come in, to be in our lives, to live through us, that you would change our heart, that you would make us new, that we would love what you love, and that the kingdom of God would overflow into every area of our lives. Lord, come, live through us, make us what you want us to be. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you please join us now?